So hello and welcome to resume. I'll also be letting you know how to create a compelling resume. Uh, I am Alina Zarati, the Equal Heart AmeriCorps Program Coordinator. Uh, I'll be the speaker for today. I have served two AmeriCorps terms and have spent time in the nonprofit sector and the for-profit sector. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box. I will answer all questions at the end of the webinar. Also, this is today's live webinar for July 27th, that's today's date. Um, and it will be recorded. So if for whatever reason you need to leave halfway through, that is completely fine. Um, we will be sharing the recording through email next week. Um, and also, if you later on uh, need the information, you can also re uh, find the information in email there as well. Um, so let's see. I thought this cartoon would be fitting um, as you all finish or are about to finish your AmeriCorps term, and you totally rocked at it. So let's go ahead and get started. So the agenda for today, we will be talking about how to prepare um, for transition, transitioning out of your AmeriCorps service into your next step, um, whatever that next step might be, um, how to translate your service term into career speak, how to create a resume and cover letter, and we'll be dis discussing tips for interviews, and then um, lastly, I'll be giving you some resources uh, to access for further use and guidance. Um, we have a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So I really wanted to have a good understanding of what our service term means. So I want you to kind of reflect um, a little bit about yourself and your service term. So I want you to ask yourself these two questions and be as honest with yourself as possible. Um, so let's start with the first one. How comfortable are you describing your service? Um, so think it over in your head. Um, you know, what is what you're doing every day at your site? How would you translate that to somebody that has no idea about the organization that you're working or you're serving with are um, no idea what AmeriCorps is at the beginning. Um, so think about that. Is it is it troubling to like kind of find the words um, that you would express um, what you're doing? Um, then maybe it's time to like reevaluate. So if your description is only about a sentence long, then Let's look at a couple of examples so that we can truly be able to explain um, what your term of service means. So if you're in a mobile feeding program, um, your description of service might sound like, I serve in a warehouse um, working on a mobile food access network. Um, primary duties include interviewing and qualifying members for the, of the community uh, to receive food resources, food acquisition, including pickup, delivery and physical distribution of food resources uh, to the community. I also assist with the loading and unloading of food delivery and direct um, assembly of food to, um, to the neighbors. Physical demands are similar to what warehouse staff experience. Um, equipment includes uh, using pallet jack scales, tables, and dollies. Um, so that's a, an easy way to describe exactly what you're doing at your uh, site an easy way to make it make it clear to people that don't have any idea of what AmeriCorps is or maybe not have an idea of what the organization that you're serving at does. So you have to kind of connect pieces for them um, in simple speak. So saying things like it's similar to a warehouse staff experience. Um, gives them an idea that that's kind of the setting of what you're working in. If you're working that's more like a kitchen style, then you can say that. If you're doing, um, on the other hand, like if you're working on a site where you're serving children, um, your description is obviously going to sound different. And it might sound like, um, I support at a library or other static enrichment sites, after school programming, 
um, through direct service and capacity building activities. I engage uh, in direct service by implement, implementing enrichment activities and distributing free after school meals to children um, at, pro at programs in libraries or community centers. They build capacity by assisting um, center staff in creating activities and outreach materials for the program. So in that description, you're obviously stating that you are focusing on creating enrichment activities while also distributing the free meals to the children um, that are at the enrichment site. So it's very clear what you're doing. That can be taken for many different organizations that partner with Equal Heart. Um, so anytime that you're working with children, you definitely want to have an understanding or let, have a clear understanding of what you're doing and how to express it to others. Um, so sometimes you'll get questions of, like, oh, it's a summer camp, or oh, you're doing like an after school program, and that might fit to what you're doing, and it's an easier way of explaining things. Um, but you also want to make sure that they understand that this is directly for the community and directly. Um, a way that you're spending your time serving the community. So being able to accurately or describe your term of service is very important, not only for your resume, but also during interviews. Um, if you're not able to explain what your term of service was, then there's little chance of an employer to understand the importance um, of your role within the program. So now let's take a look at the second question. How would you describe AmeriCorps to someone determining your career path? So this focuses more if somebody saw AmeriCorps on your resume and had no idea what it was about. Um, how would you be able to describe what AmeriCorps is? Um, so a lot of people see it as volunteer, which it is, um, but also being able to explain more than just volunteering within your community. Um, some people might be more familiar with VISTA because it was around longer and had more an emphasis on its launch. Um, so you might meet some people that understand VISTA but don't really understand, um, you know, state and national AmeriCorps members and all the other um, terms of AmeriCorps members that there can be. But it is good to be able to explain what you did directly and how you are involved in your AmeriCorps term. So that might sound like, um, let's see. So it might sound a little bit like AmeriCorps is a voluntary civil um, society program uh, supported by the US federal government, um, foundations and corporations and other donors engaging in adults in public service work with the goal of helping others and meeting critical needs in the community. So very easy to explain. Obviously, it's a federal agency um, putting adults in communities that need direct um, help, alleviating some of the big issues. Uh, issues that Equal Heart currently um, is facing is um, poverty and food insecurity. So everybody has some role of food insecurity, whether you're working at a mobile food program or if you're working on an after school program feeding children um, free food, then that is all part of making sure that food is accessible to all children and families within your community. So it's very important to be able to accurately describe both your service term and AmeriCorps um, because there's frequent questions um, asked, asked whenever you submit a resume or whenever you go in for an interview. Um, all the interviews that I have been um, been at for my, myself, I've always been asked about my AmeriCorps experience, and only once um, did I have the opportunity to actually talk to somebody that understood and knew already what AmeriCorps was before we actually had the conversation. So being able to act actually um, explain what you did during your AmeriCorps term and also explaining AmeriCorps to somebody that might have never heard about it before is very, very useful. And also um, a way just to share knowledge and be an ambassador service, but also a way of getting people to understand the impact that you made and the commitment you had to making a difference in the community. And it really shows um, about the type of person that you are, that you did commit to serve these 300 or 450 hours throughout the summer. 
that's a good good thing to be able to do. Okay. So next, um, we'll be talking about preparing for the transition. So if you you're currently finishing up your AmeriCorps term, um, or if you started a couple of years ago, and it's always a good time to prepare for your next step, no matter what that step is, whether you know you're just doing this for the summer and now you're about to go back to school in the fall, or if this is your fourth and final term, and um, you know now you're looking for a more permanent position with an organization or going into the for-profit sector, um, whatever your next step is, it's always very important to prepare for that transition. Um, so you want to get an understanding of what you are interested in. So an easy way of doing this is going to job boards and simply reading the job description and saving the ones that you're actually interested in. So I will do this. I um, will pull up like Idealist or pull up um, Indeed or just anywhere and just look at all the job descriptions. And um, I'm not looking at pay requirements. I'm not looking at um, you know pay or requirements, or I'm not looking at um, recommended like if they recommend a certain type of degree or anything like that. I'm simply looking at things that interest me. So I will copy all the ones that actually interest me into a Word document, and then I'll start looking <laughs> at them all. I gotta have a handful of them that I'm like, okay, yeah, that, that looks interesting. And I'm just copying them in. And then I go in and start looking and seeing what do they have in common? So if I end up saving all the jobs that happen to have something about um, volunteering or something about animals, then maybe I have an interest of um, volunteering in a community, but also working alongside animals. Um, so then finding the job that is your perfect fit. Um, so then I will start looking for jobs that have volunteering and animals in it. So maybe the perfect job could be a volunteer coordinator at a local adoption rescue um, organization for animals. That could be a good fit. And that's just a quick example, but it's an easy way of getting an understanding and realizing what's actually calling you to a job. So without looking at the pay, without looking at the requirements, you get an understanding of this is actually something that I'm interested in, not just because, oh, it's paying $20 an hour, or oh, because I can use my degree directly again, or at that organization. Um, so sometimes I feel like it's more important to be able to find a job that you find interesting, um, just because it could make it so much easier to get out of bed every day and go to work, um, to be able to do that can make a big difference. And also just the way that you view um, you know, your work life and also just the way that you view how productive you are at work can also change just by really enjoying and really having a heart for what you're doing. Okay, so then after that, you also want to have an understanding of what are your top interests and your must haves in a job. So whenever you are searching for jobs, it's also a good thing to keep in mind of what are your must-haves. Um, so it's very important to make sure that your job fits to your needs. So this whole interviewing process, the whole going and searching for a job, it's two ways. A lot of people only see it one way that you apply and that um, you interview and it's all dependent on the company, but it's also dependent on you. So, um, you know, for whatever reason, if you were to see a job posting and you're like, yeah, no, that that's not it for me. That's not exactly what I want to do. Don't apply. Um, I know it sounds really simple, but I feel like a lot of people see um, maybe the pay or see that their degree is directly aligned with it. Um, and then they apply and then they get into a job that they just really, really don't like. Um, so it's much better to be able to be working somewhere that you are very passionate about um, than what it is to be just making sure that um, you know you only fit one box you only checked off one box that like the pay is good or that your degree fits with it um, it's very important to check off as many boxes as possible even if some of those bigger or more important boxes kind of get left unchecked for now 
but I definitely have an understanding of your wants from a job. Maybe if it's that you're in school and you need a more lenient schedule, that's definitely a need that needs to be checked off by a box. Maybe if it's that you, um, you know, you need to start paying off the loans or maybe you have a lot of debt um, and you really need something to be able to um, financially support you, then maybe, yeah, that money is going to be one of those check boxes that need to be checked off. Um, maybe you have a want to be in the nonprofit sector for the rest of your career, then, you know, a job that is a nonprofit organization is definitely going to be a big checkbox. Um, some things are kind of like smaller checkboxes or things that can be like hit or miss with jobs is maybe you want every weekend off. Maybe not working on the weekends is a big checkbox for you. Um, so just really being honest with yourself and understanding what are the needs that you want to take out of this job and what are some things that are non-negotiable um, that you really want to get out of the job as well. So just remember that it is finding the right place. Um, so I, I know it can take some time um, just looking at job boards, and I, I, I spent quite a bit of time just looking at job boards, seeing the jobs that are out there. Um, but it also makes it a lot easier whenever you're making a decision because you already have all this research that you've done into that decision. So just like whenever you make any other big decision in life, um, whether it's buying a car, or buying a home, um, you know, whatever the decision is, where you're going to go to college, all of these things, um, you spend quite a bit of time on it. You spend quite a bit of time researching, looking into, um, you know, did other people like, you know, going to this school or, you know, what's the safety rating on this car or anything that you would do to research another big life change. You want to spend just about the same amount of time looking into the type of career you want to get into and also the type of jobs that um, you're interested in applying at. So definitely spend a lot of time researching and really make um, really good notes about, you know, this is why I like this job. These are some questions I have, or maybe I didn't like this job for this reason. I wanna make sure that the next job I go into, um, you know, there's more support or there's more, um, you know, more time to take off um, because that was something that was a problem for me at my current or previous job. Also, a great way to get some insider information on an organization or a career interest is meeting with people that currently have that job. So make appointments um, with people that you are truly interested in the work that they're doing. Um, it can be anywhere from like a 15 minute conversation to like an hour long meeting um, just to discuss what they do. Um, so like their day to day and also to see if that truly interests you. So if you are interested, let's say that you're interested in being a zookeeper, uh, just for example, and then you go and actually meet with a zookeeper and you find out the majority of his time, he is spending it just making diets for um, the animals. And it's really more about, you know, being on the, on the level of just making the food and like making sure that they have enough vitamins and things like that. So he's spending a lot of time behind the scenes, not really with the animals. Um, so then maybe realizing that, oh, I really wanted to be with the animals. I didn't want to spend so much time behind the scenes and understanding, okay, maybe instead of being, you know, a zookeeper that's more focused on dietary needs, maybe I need to be a zoo trainer. Um, so understanding that there's like little differences within things that can make a big difference in the actual impact that you're having at your job and your day-to-day -day, um, day -day activities. So talking to people that have that job, it's a lot easier to get an understanding of what that might look like. Um, you can also do this by shadowing. Um, a lot of organizations are more than willing to have you come in and shadow and just see, you know, what a day looks like, um, especially if you're really considering starting your career. Uh, it's really great to have an opportunity to shadow and understand, you know, what are the needs of a job? What are some of the problems that people face there? And um, ways of support that are, that are there at the job. So if you're considering anything in the nonprofit world, you can always volunteer at an organization to see, you know, kind of an understanding of what's going on. Um, 
I definitely would recommend that for anybody that has the opportunity um, to do that. And it's also a really great way to get to know more people that are in within that um, career field. And it's also a great way to network. So get an understanding of what it takes to be in the role, but also be able to communicate and let people know that you're interested in that role. So, you know, whatever might pop up in the future, if they already have your name and your resume and they know that you're interested, then you might be the very top person at that list rather than, you know, seeing it on a job board and applying online like everybody else. Um, so definitely a good thing to consider. Um, always reach out to people. You'll be surprised how many people are willing just to talk to you um, because just like you at one point, they were um, interested in finding a job and trying to find the right job to fit. So a lot of people will be more than willing to reach out and, and talk to you about it. So along with that, now is a perfect time to ask their letters of recommendation. Um, you have just about successfully completed your AmeriCorps term. Um, your program site manager would be a great person to reach out to. You can also reach out to the Equal Heart AmeriCorps staff, including myself. Um, so strong letters of recommendation can make a really big difference, not only within the hiring process, but also for scholarships. Um, so it's always better to ask for a recommendation letter as soon as you end your term. While your impact is still very memorable in your supervisor's mind, rather than a year or two from now, um, you know, whenever you end up needing a recommendation letter and you end up having to reach out saying like, hey, I did an AmeriCorps term with you two years ago, um, you know, can you write me a, a uh, recommendation letter now? It's going to be a little tough to remember not only one, who you are, um, if you haven't kept in contact very well. And then two, what your direct service was or some big impact that was gained through your direct service. So you definitely want to make sure you do it right after your term or even in the middle of your term um, to get a good recommendation letter um, that truly speaks to your true personality and the impact that you made. Um, and also it lowers the chance of you getting a very generic um, resume, or sorry, a very generic recommendation letter. And if you do get a very generic one, you can also get the option of like, is it possible for me to write my recommendation letter for you to review and edit? Um, and then if you agree with it, sign off on. So I had a um, high school teacher that I was asking for a recommendation letter whenever I was applying to college. And he would always have students write their own recommendation letter because you will be so much more critical on yourself um, than what most people will be to you. So he would always have us write our own and he'll write his alongside it. And then he'll kind of like merge the two and off of that merged one, that's what he would sign off on. Um, but he would always say that his students are a lot more critical of um, themselves than what you know he would be to his students. So definitely a good thing to consider if, you know, um, one, if your manager is really um, busy or stressed or, you know, you don't meet with them that often, you can give that option. Um, and if they're not comfortable with that, that's completely fine. Um, just asking for a recommendation letter to begin with definitely can help out. Um, but also, if you want to write a recommendation letter for yourself, just to see, you know, where your strengths, where your weakness, how do you feel? Um, your impact was during the service term, it definitely makes um, a real big difference. Okay. So it's also um, important that as you finish any part of your career life, um, it's important to up update your resume. So make sure that you include any new things that you've learned, any cert uh, certifications that you've gained, um, if you've recently graduated, include that. Um, also remember to exclude things that might seem too dated. So if this happened 10 years ago and it really wasn't that important, um, take it off of there. Take it off of the resume. It's no need. Uh, it's no longer needed to be on there. Um, or if it has nothing to do with the position that you're currently 
applying for, then again, take it off there. It's really no need of being on the resume. And we'll go into this a little bit more, um, a little later. Okay, so translating your service to career speed. So I remember finishing my first AmeriCorps term and being like, oh man, like I know what I did day to day, but how do I turn that into other people being able to understand what I did day to day and how big of an impact that was? Um, so sometimes thinking of what exactly you did in your service can be hard to turn into career speed. So these questions should get you in the ballpark of thinking about um, things you are responsible for, you know, what activities did you complete, what skills did you develop, um, what did you accomplish, as well as any technical skills, communication skills. Um, a lot of times when I speak with students that are doing the um, dealing more with children, a lot of times they say that like you gain patience with the children. Include that. Um, it's definitely a skill to have being able to communicate um, with all types of individuals, whether it's you know five year olds all the way to dealing with um, grown ups. It's definitely a different way to communicate and definitely something you can highlight through your resume. So these questions should get you started thinking about everything you did during your service term. So for example, if you were a direct to door member with Equal Heart, then you might have been responsible for inputting information about food recipients or inputting weights of donations. Um, this can be translated to career speak by stating that you did data input and upkeeping. So if you are a member at a partner site, um, then an activity that you might have completed. Um, so you might have created a class or a program. I had a member previously, um, she was at a library and she created a whole like um, America Sil American Sign Language class. So that was um, something that she was able to say within her skills that she's developed. So you could say that um, you are able to implement programs as well as follow through and make sure that the programs that you're applying are useful to the students. Um, so skills that have been developed within all the members is team building, um, engaging with at-risk populations. Um, maybe if you're working within a community that's heavily Hispanic um, or that has any other language barrier, you might become a little bit more bilingual. Um, you know, really strong commitment, especially for all of our members that are finishing out their AmeriCorps term or have done multiple terms. Um, it really speaks a lot that you really did commit to 300 or 450 hours of service during the summertime um, that you could have decided to do something else with. You know, you could have decided to work at Starbucks or you could have decided to, um, you know, work at Sephora somewhere a little bit more fun or you could have just took a summer off and, um, you know, took some time for yourself, but you really dedicated yourself to making a difference in the community, and that's something you can strongly emphasize by saying that you do have a strong commitment um, to making change within the community, but also a strong commitment to following through on the promises that you made by staying within the term. Okay. So another thing, um, accomplish accomplishments should be rather easy. So you've all completed your term hours, or you're about to. Um, but you can also think, think of things that you directly impacted by serving. So really get into the numbers of it. How many children um, did you feed during the summer? Did you help students with their homework or study? And did that improve their grades or have a better understanding by the end of the summer? Um, did you track any social emotional changes with students or with the um, children that you're feeding on a daily basis? Um, how many pounds of food did you serve to at-risk populations? Um, an easy way to track what you accomplished is looking back and seeing what was the focus for every month and did you meet any goals that you had or any challenges that you overcome? Um, so being able to look back, it might be a little harder the farther away you get from your service term to say, I did exactly this on this day. Um, but 
something that I really enjoyed doing whenever I was an AmeriCorps member was having a daily journal. Um, so anytime that I met with a child, anytime that I um, I did something that I was like, oh, well, I actually did that by myself. This time. I recorded in my journal. And at the end of my service, it was very easy for me to go back and look through my journal and say like, oh, like that day I accomplished this. And it was like the highlight of my day because I got little Timmy to move his um, reading score up by 20 points or by five points, wherever the case may be. Um, but those were big impacts that made like a big difference on the way that I was feeling that my direct service was actually making a difference. Or, um, you know, whenever members of the community would come up to me and be like very thankful for the food we were providing and just express, um, you know, circumstances that they're dealing with, maybe I would reflect on that. Um, and that was something that was directly being solved by me being an Air Corps member and being able to be there to provide food. So I know, um, you know, you kind of get into the day to day and you kind of forget what's the big picture. Um, definitely looking at the numbers makes a huge difference. Um, so, and we'll go into more detail about that here in a little bit about actually um, looking at the numbers and seeing the impact that you've made. But definitely having an understanding of what you've accomplished, um, the goals that you had for yourself at the beginning of the term. Are you achieving those goals? You know, what are some of the things that you're lacking, being able to have an understanding of that so you can be stronger moving forward. So if you ask your organization um, that you're serving with about impact numbers, each organization should be able to give you the total um, amount of numbers that you've done during the summer, whether that's your total end hours or if you want to look at how many children you served during the summer, or if you want to look at how many meals you actually hand it out to children during the summer. If you want to look at, um, if you're in the direct door program, if you want to look at how many pounds of food um, was given away to the community, we can definitely get all those numbers for you. Um, so being able to put in very clear numbers um, within your resume can make a stronger connection for employers that are trying to scale and size the type of programs that you serve on. So if I were to tell you that I, uh, during the summer, I was helping children with their um, homework and then also feeding them meals, the person that's interviewing me might not have any idea of how large of a scope that is. So that might just mean that I was taking care of my little brother and helping him like read on the side. Um, and that could have been that sentence applied to that. So you definitely want to make sure that you use numbers whenever you're explaining um, what you've done. So instead of saying that, um, you know, I was just serving, I was helping children with after school work and then also serving them food, I can say that I was managing 15 um, children and helping them with their academic studies along with feeding them um, a breakfast and a lunch Monday through Friday for three months out of the summer. So being able to have that exactly mapped out um, and kind of like the math of how many people you were serving, how many meals you were serving, you could even go a step farther and say, I served you know, a thousand meals this summer to at-risk populations in the Dallas community. Um, and that will even have a more impactful scope than what it would just saying, I fed meals to students over the summer, and that's it. Um, so you definitely want to give the employer an opportunity to actually get a grasp of how big of an impact you made this summer. Um, so definitely include those numbers in there. It's the easiest way you can do it. Okay. So the next thing is definitely learning the terms of the field that you want to go into. Um, can make a really big difference on your resume. So if you are looking at job boards, and this is another way that looking at job boards um, is a really big, helpful time saver. Um, so if you're looking at job boards and, um, you know, you see a lot of the jobs that you're actually interested in has the same wording, um, maybe it'll be best to change your resume to use that wording as well. Or if you 
if you find one um, job that you're really interested in and they keep using the same word, then adopt that word. So for example, if you see within a job board um, ad and they call their community members recipients, then adopt the term for your resume and cover letter. So instead of calling um, the children that you would normally just put like, oh, behind every door, children, you can say recipients of the program. Um, this way, not only are you adopting the language that they're using, you're kind of making yourself blend in already. Um, so using the organization that you're applying or the company that you're applying with, using their same wording they would use um, can be really useful and just kind of like blending in. I've also seen this done by adopting color schemes and fonts um, that a company uses. Of course, you don't want to go like overboard and like put their logo on your resume. Like, don't do that. Um, but definitely you can adopt their color scheme. So for example, Equal Hearts color scheme is red, um, red, white, and really black. Um, so if you are interested in maybe working full time with Equal Heart, then you could adopt that red color into your resume in very subtle ways. Um, and maybe even using the same fonts that we have on our web page. Just making you, making, presenting yourself like you're already part of the team. Um, just because it's just going to look familiar. It's going to look like you already belong. Um, so that's an easy way of kind of tweaking things very slightly to make it seem more comfortable and seem like you're already there, um, already plugged in for employers. Okay. Also, um, get an understanding of what different titles translate to in j different job sectors. So, for example, in the nonprofit sector, community outreach is the same as it is um, as in for the for-profit sector, which is called marketing. So, in the public and in the public sector, it's called public awareness. So, these three different titles all mean the same thing, um, which is really that you're communicating to the community and trying to get resources in, or maybe get volunteers in. Um, or maybe even let the community know about the resources that you offer, but they all have three different meanings depending on what sector you're interested in applying in. So definitely have an understanding if you're really interested in working with the community, have an understanding of what all community titles mean and what their actual duties are, um, because it can be a little confusing seeing all the job boards and seeing all the different titles, but if you have an understanding of what those titles mean, it's a lot easier to navigate through. So by using um, words within the sector in the sector that you're applying to, uh, you're molding your, your service to fit the requirements. Um, it is very important though, not to go overboard with this. Uh, it's one thing to mold your, your service and another thing to completely lie about your service. So we're definitely making sure that we're not um, just blatantly lying and um, you know saying that you've done more things or saying that it was a larger impact than what it was. Um, so there's a very fine line to play there. But we, if you're hesitant about it, it's best to leave it out. Um, and you'll hear me say that more than once. In this webinar, if you're hesitant about adding something to your resume because you don't feel too sure about it, leave it out. It's best to um, be able to express that you are a little bit confident in that area, but maybe you still need some guidance um, rather than putting it on there and an employer expecting you to already know um, how to handle a situation and you know, kind of being kind of being caught um, that you lied on your resume and you don't. You don't know how to handle the situation. So if in doubt, leave it out. Okay, so crafting a compelling resume. Um, these are some simple things that can really change your resume. Um, remember that your resume is really your chance to stand out and show what you're capable of. This is your time to kind of like brag about yourself. Um, I recommend creating a master resume um, of everything you've ever done related to volunteering or um, employment. And then after uh, your, 
after or during your service reflect about the type of service you perform at the organization. Um, it'll be easier to remember when you do this while it's still fresh in your mind. So after you have everything down, then look back and only use the items that apply to the current job you're applying for. So for example, if I am applying for a teaching position, I might want to highlight that I worked at a summer camp um, working directly with children. And I might leave out um, or just spend less time on the fact that I worked at Whataburger for a couple months in the summer. Compared to if I was applying to a customer service job, then I might highlight that I worked at Whataburger and um, received employee of the month, even though I was only working there for a couple months. Um, and it shows, you know, how great of service that I had during those couple months there. Um, so definitely tailoring your resume for the job that you want, um, being able to understand, you know, showing your strengths within that job and showing direct examples of what they're expecting out of you and how you are prepared to give that to the company or to the organization. So you can also um, include examples of like times at a business or organization that might have been difficult and how you overcome it. Um, for example, if you had multiple managers change during their service, um, which often happens in life, um, then you might have you might have had to take on more roles um, with little supervision or um, little support. So make that negative into a positive. So although you would hope to never be in a situation where you don't have somebody to uh, reach out for support or supervision, um, you can definitely make that into a positive uh, very quickly in your resume by highlighting the fact that you might have been trusted with more tasks um, and how you might have had to self um, teach yourself or or on the job um, taught yourself how to handle situations. Um, make sure that you have a strong example of how you overcome a problem because if they do see some of those more negative items on your resume, they um, will more than likely ask you about it. So if you do say that um, you are a very quick learner and the reason that you have this experience is because um, you know a manager had left and you had to adapt to carrying on more roles than originally were um, your responsibility, then have an exact example of whenever your manager left and what you were responsible for as those additional roles and how you saw a direct um, change or direct growth in yourself by taking on those added tasks. Now let's look at one sentence um, for finding data points. So for example, um, you might write on your resume, I served children lunch during the summer. Um, with, that, with that statement alone, the employer has no idea of how many children you were serving. So we were talking about this a little bit um, earlier. So you definitely want to make sure that you're adding in those numbers, whether it's numbers of volunteers you recruited, numbers of meals you served, numbers of hours you served. Just make sure that they understand um, that you made an impact this summer and what was the scale of that impact. Um, if not, then you're leaving um, the employer to fill out you know, the rest for themselves and it could end up hurting you in the end. So if they don't have an idea of what you did, maybe they're thinking too small, and uh, like, oh, well, maybe they don't have the experience I thought that they did. So make sure that you're making it very clear from the beginning. Um, so again, an easy example for this is um, of sharing details. You can say that, so one that might not be as strong is saying, over the summer, I helped fight hunger in the South Dallas area by distributing summer meals daily to children. So an easy way of making this state statement um, go a step farther and quantifying the statement, you can now say that um, over three months, I helped fight hunger in the South Dallas area by distributing 2,000 meals um, to over 50 children. By being more detailed, you're giving a better understanding of what you did direct, what you were directly in charge of. Okay. So now I want to break the resume into parts and really dive deep into each part and um, 
I do want to lead this by saying that each resume is going to be, it's not going to be the same. So whether you are applying um, for a federal job, if you're applying for um, a nonprofit job, if you're applying for a uh, for profit job, all of them are going to look a little bit different. Um, for example, government um, jobs want to know everything you've ever done. So they definitely want a lot of detail. Um, well, if you're applying for a for-profit job, they might only want to see um, items that relate to the job that you're applying for. Compared to a nonprofit job, um, they might want to see things that aren't necessarily job experience, but if you volunteered with them or if you volunteered at an agency that shows that you really have um, a strong love for wherever the organization um, focus is, and it might be really important to put that you volunteered there, that you majored in that. Um, well, in other, in other sectors, um, you know, it might not be as important to include on a resume. Okay, so not all of them are going to look the same, so what I'm offering, like, here in this resume, or sorry, in this webinar, um, are just simple tips um, to make your resume more compelling and professional. Um, so again, it can look very different and it just depends on the type of job that you're actually applying for. So with that being said, let's go ahead and look at the heading um, of an example resume. So the first thing that I noticed is that Alex's resume doesn't even have um, his full name on it. So Although this seems so simple, um, I've even had people turn in resumes to me that don't have a name at all um, or are completely missing a way of getting in contact with them. Um, unfortunately, this has happened where we wanted to hire somebody and then we go look at their resume and there's nothing on it. Uh, and we met them at a job fair and I was like, oh, we don't have any contact information for this person at all now. And they were. Um, you know, a very strong candidate, and unfortunately, we never got in contact with them because we didn't have um, the full information on the resume. So I know it seems very simple um, just to include your full name and contact information, but it could be very detrimental if you do not include it. So I really want to highlight that. Um, so then we also want to make sure that not only do you have your full name, but you have all your contact information correct. So it's also happened to me a couple times during the hiring process that um, I would call people to set up an interview and the um, either the email bounced or the phone number that they gave me was completely wrong. Um, so it'd be really awkward calling people and trying to schedule a um, interview and then find out that like that's not even the person that I'm trying to call. Um, so you definitely, definitely, definitely want to make sure that that information is up to date. Um, and also, if you ever submit a resume and then um, you haven't heard back from them, but you're still really interested in hearing back from them and your information changes, let them know. Send them an email saying like, hi, I submitted my resume, but I have a change of address or a change of phone number. Um, this is my current number. It is um, much more appreciated than um, trying to get in contact with you and not being able to and could potentially cost you the job. Um, so, making sure all the information is correct, but also making sure that your email address is appropriate. Um, and it's completely okay to create a whole new account just for business. Um, I actually do this. I have my work um, address and I also have one that I just have accounts on and I have one that's like spam emails. Um, so, whenever I go into Bath and Body Works and they're asking me to type in my email. I type in the one with spam so I can get the coupons, but I don't have to deal with it in all my other emails. Um, so it's a good thing to have a couple different emails to be able uh, to use. But if you are using one for everything, just make sure it's appropriate. Um, you know, nothing, I think we all know what appropriate is. Um, so I don't feel like I need to go into too much detail about it, but if you're questionable, questioning about, um, you know, I've had the same email since I was in, you know, high school, and I just always use this one, but maybe it's not that professional, then go ahead and get a new one. Um, emails are free, not like you have to pay for it. So just get a new one. It's better to be um, safe than 
get your resume rejected because they didn't think you're professional enough just by your email name. Okay, so some common, um, we're looking at objectives now. So some common problems that um, we often find with objectives is um, it's too generic or it's too self-focused. It doesn't tell in detail um, what you have to offer. So objectives are good whenever you're starting out or have yet to establish, establish yourself in a profession um, or are changing careers or industries. So this applies to most of the AmeriCorps, um, Equal Heart AmeriCorps alum, considering that you are, majority of y'all are young um, and might not have five to seven years of work experience um, to really stand out on your resume, then this is a great chance um, for you to say who you are and what makes you different than the rest of the candidates. Um, now I wanna compare the two examples um, of an objective. Looking at the first objective, um, it says a challenging um, creative opportunity where I can apply my skills in a dynamic organization with plenty of room for advancement. It is a little poor. So <laughs> the reason why this objective is poor is because it's very generic. Um, it's self-focused and it doesn't tell in detail what you have to offer. So it hits all three of our common problems. So if we were to rewrite um, the objective, looking at the second objective, it might sound like to apply the knowledge acquired through a bachelor's degree in software engineering and two summer internships at software agencies to an entry level position on the software engineering team of a major tech, um, technology institution. This is a stronger objective because it's clear and gives direct detail of what the applicant is trying to attain. So he is trying um, to attain an entry level, entry level position on a software engineering team. So it's very clear what he wants to gain out of it. And it gives direct detail of what the applicant, um, how the applicant is prepared to successfully complete the position because he already has his knowledge acquired through a bachelor's degree um, in software engineering and also two summer internships in a software agency. So it's very clear about how he has the skill set to be able to perform the task. And of course, um, everywhere there's room for improvement, um, but he could have also included more detail about the software agency um, that, the, that he had previously worked at. Um, so always room for improvement, um, so that's just something that he could have included as well. Okay, now looking at the qualification summary. So if you've already been working for a while and you're looking for a new job in the same field, um, skipping the objective and opening the qualification summary would be to your best, um, to help you the best because obviously you have some experience, um, you know, you're qualified for, these are all the reasons why you're qualified to be able to handle this, um, this new job. And also if you're not switching with a new field, then you should be fairly comfortable in the field that you're, um, you're currently working in. So this can be done in paragraph form or bulletin list. Um, looking at the example summary, it has some issues with it. So the example summary is um, poor because it doesn't, it does nothing um, that differentiates the candidate and it states um, what the candidate wants and it's very vague. So this very top sentence is a qualification summary. So he's saying, looking to attain a position as a software engineer and to apply many years of experience and skills. So let's look at ways that we can make the qualification summary, um, you know, better to fit what his skills actually are. So accomplished um, software engineer with four years experience in software writing with a proven record of successful code. Apt to add at combining in-depth knowledge of industry practices and safety requirements with flawless coding, um, strategic layouts, and skillful relationships to secure new and repeat business. So this new qualification summary clearly states how the applicant is qualified for the job. 
again, this is meant to highlight um, that the applicant has been in the industry and that they have adequate amount of experience to perform all tasks that are being asked of him. Um, you already want, you really want to shine um, through above everything else. So really focusing on your strengths um, and making sure you're hitting all the requirements that are posted on the job board or wherever you're um, seeing that there is an opening for the job, making sure that you're hitting those things that they, they are really asking for. So if you don't have lots of work experience, um, skip this and only stick to the objectives. So now moving on to work experience. Um, this is where you can relate previous experience directly to what, you're, what they're looking for. Um, so some of the most common problems are um, that it's written like a job description or it gives no scope of the business, um, using inconsistent bulletin wording, um, and then it's listing items that have no relevance to the new job. Um, so for so for the first problem, this means that um, you should be including more than just listing the duties that were assigned to you. Um, it should show how you achieve results in those duties. So again, this is a great way of actually being able to reflect on the service that you've just completed or about to complete and show exactly what you were in charge of doing. Um, rather than just saying, oh, I helped the children during the summer and I was responsible for cleaning up um, at the site and I was also responsible for doing academic programs with the children, really put that into more words. And um, rather than just listing the things that you did, also explain the impact that you made. So for the second problem of giving no scope to the business, um, you want to give the employer an idea of how big or grassroots your experience is. So again, this is another way of adding in numbers um, to come, come in handy, of course, so giving an idea of scope of um, the impact that you made. So for number three, um, use of inconsistent bulletin, uh, bulletin wording. So you want to make sure that the words that you're using are action words to describe your, your accomplishments. Words like facilitated, negotiated, reorganized, developed, created, lead, um, et cetera. Uh, to be able to make sure that you're using words that clearly show that you directly um, did those items, but also making sure that you're using action words because those are all things that you actually did. So for the last problem, um, so listing items that have no relevance to the new job, you want to make sure that you're only putting um, job experience that is relevant to the current job that you're applying for. Of course, as mentioned before, um, this can also not apply um, when you're creating a resume for a government job. Or if you have little work experience, then you definitely want to show, um, you know, even though it might not relate to the job you're applying for, if it's the only work experience you have, it's better to have it on your resume than to leave it off. Um, so this kind of this kind of is depending on this set on this set, but if you do have quite a bit of work experience or if you have things that better fit um, towards that job description, I would highlight those items and maybe even leave the other ones off or just not emphasize them as much. Okay, so I want to look at the um, work experience that he currently has. We are going to break these down and fix them and um, see if we can make them a little bit, a little bit better. So the first one, um, able to do complex program applications um, by taking specifications and or requirements and translating into practical coding. So we can change that to being um, right up here. So applied knowledge and skills to um, adapt complex program specification and requirements into practical coding. So rather than we're we're using our action words, right? Apply. Um, so we definitely made a little bit of changes there. So and I mean it goes on continuing. Um, I want to skip down to the third one. So coding, recognition, uh, processing, and or standardizing efficiencies and making suggestions for improvement if applicable. 
So we uh, change it to manage coding recognition, um, processing and standardizing and efficiencies, recommended improvements to current codes. So rather than saying that like, if there was um, changes needed, then I did it. Like you would hope that you would hope that somebody would do that if they see uh, the change needs to. Happen. It's kind of an assumption that you would take responsibility to make that change. So uh, we would change that to recommended improvements for current codes. So that's saying that the current codes that are there, you've already made the recommendations of improvements that they saw, rather than um, leaving it more more astray in the in the previous um, wording. Okay. So moving on to education. So as a rule, the longer it's been since you were in school, the less emphasis um, you need to place on the education sector, or se section, not sector, sorry. Um, so recent graduates, um, the education sector section um, should come first. For members that are more um, seasoned professionals, then education sector can go towards the bottom. Um, since the example um, education se section is pretty plain, um, I just want to go over some general rules. Uh, the education sec section is perfect when it gives the necessary information without excruciating details. Um, so you definitely want to list your highest level of education first. So if you have a college degree, um, I would recommend leaving out your high school um, because you definitely want to be listing uh, the highest level of education that you have. If you have multiple degrees, I would strongly recommend um, listing those degrees out though. Um, and then if you are spelling your, your school name, Spell them out. Do not um, leave acronyms in your resume. Um, I know it can make your resume look a little bit more lengthy, um, but you definitely want to make sure that they have a complete understanding of the exact school that you went to and leave no guesswork in there. Um, and then if you do not have a uh, stellar GPA, uh, I would recommend anything below a 3.2. Don't so put it on your resume. Um, just leave it out. and. For whatever chance, if you need to submit a transcript or if you need to um, provide a GPA, then you can do so. Um, but if it's above, above a 3.2, I'd recommend leaving it out. Uh, don't list activities that are not professionally, um, that are professionally irrelevant. So, of course, making sure that your education is molded towards the job that you're applying for. Um, if you are applying to be um, within a flower shop. Maybe it's really important to emphasize that you took classes on botany and um, soil, but you know, maybe you leave out the parts that you did um, a political science minor um, because it's not really relevant to the job that you're currently applying for. So some last um, reminders that you should follow for the resume as a whole. Uh, make sure you spell check um, it's something that is so simple, but even if your resume has one spelling error on it, that can mean that it goes straight to the trash. Um, so letting somebody proofread your resume will help you um, make sure that the spelling is well correct and make sure that everything that you want to express gets across clearly. Um, do not, and I can't emphasize this enough, uh, lie on your resume when it comes to the work. Um, it will be clear if you lied or not. Um, unless you are a graphic design major or an art major, then keep your resume simple. Uh, don't put too much color or different types of text or change the size of the text too often. And we'll go into that a little bit more detail in here in a second. So it should be easy. Your resume should be easy to read and not too distracting. Um, consider the type of font that you want to use as well. Um, again, when we previously talked about maybe adopting the businesses font or the organization's font, consider doing that. If the font is a little too crazy, maybe that's not the best way to go. Um, also, considering if you want to use serif fonts um, that are easier to read compared to sans serif, and 
if you're not sure what that is. Um, stem serif fonts are fonts that do not have um, like extended parts of the letters on it. So, for example, the text that is in uh, the chat box, that is sans serif, or sorry, serif. Got confused there for a second. It's serif. So, it makes it easier to read the I just because every letter is going to be the same size. So, it's just in the brain, it's easier to read. Um, so, ideally, whenever you are making your resume, you want to make it uh, very easy to read. So, maybe using a serif font. Um, will be just one little thing that will be um, beneficial to use. Next is also considering the type of paper you want to uh, print your resume on. Um, the best option is to print on resume paper. Um, it's not expensive. Um, you can buy a pack and it will probably last you your whole career um, as long as you're not giving your resume out to everybody you know. Um, when printing on resume paper, make sure that the watermark is in the correct direction. So resume paper will have a um, nearly invisible watermark on it, kind of like a little a little print they already have on the water. You can hold the paper up um, to a good source of light, and you'll be able to see what direction that watermark is going in. So whenever you're printing, you definitely want to make sure that the watermark is going in the same direction or in the same general direction as um, your resume. Of course, you don't want it to be like flipped upside down or um, backwards or anything like that. So just a little thing to make a big difference, especially if you are going after a very um, professional job, then that might be something that has a little bit more emphasis on it. Um, and then you do not want to hole punch or staple your resume. Um, you know, you've taken, you've taken a lot of time uh, just to prepare your resume as it is. Uh, you definitely don't want to go and um, hurt yourself by stapling things to it or hole punching it. It just looks a lot less professional. Um, and then with that also being said, I think I don't, I feel like I shouldn't have to say this. Um, you all should know better. Um, do not fold it. Um, there's nothing worse than um, having somebody come with some, you know, folded up paper that's already been in our pocket for a couple of days, and and then you get on your your table and it's like kind of hard to read because you know the paper is already wearing off or it was folded. Um, yeah, you know, this paper is pretty important. It has a lot of information about you and your accomplishments. Um, so treat it with pride. Keep it clean. Um, no employer wants a dirty folded up resume on their desk. Um, I can assure you of that. Now, if you're submitting your resume um, electronically, then you want to always make sure that it is in PDF format. Um, so, you know, if you are creating your resume in Word or in Notebook, whatever the case may be, then whenever you submit it to the employer, um, you definitely want to make sure you're saving it as a PDF format. This way, um, it is very clear that this is your final drafted resume. There are no other critiques that you're trying to um, add into it or anything like that. Um, because in a PDF, you obviously can't go in and like, change around the text as you can in a um, Word document. So I emphasize this again. Um, you should never send your resume as a Word document. I've actually even seen applicants um, not be considered uh, for a job for this reason, um, just because if you're ever sending any legal documents to um, to anybody in an organization, then you do not want to be sending it as a Word document. Um, so it's kind of kind of a, an easy way to to separate applicants. Um, definitely don't want to be not considered for the job just for that reason. Okay, so you definitely, um, lastly, make sure that you have a good, safe place to store your resume on a flash drive or on a uh, on the cloud. If you use a cloud, um, you'll spend a good amount of time creating your first resume, and it, it is much easier to tailor um, 
to tailor your, your future resumes than what it is to start brand new again. Again, this goes back to creating a master resume and kind of having everything on it that you've ever done. Um, and then being able to just tailor future resumes to the job that you're applying for, it makes it so much easier um, and definitely a lot more beneficial and um, it saves you a lot of time from having to create from scratch all over again. Okay, moving into cover letters and interviews. So um, we have wrapped up with resumes but that is only one part of presenting yourself to an employer. So let's focus now on the cover letter and then um, interview tips and trip, tricks to follow. So starting with the cover layer, letter layout, um, I wanna go over a basic layout for a cover letter. Um, you wanna make sure that you have a header and that you have all the correct information um, about yourself in that header. Um, so we'll go over that with a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, and then make sure that you, oh, sorry about that, going back. Okay, make sure that you have an opening uh, greeting line, um, then get into the true letter. So the first paragraph needs to be explaining your interest in the position. Um, this can explain that it aligns with your major, or how you learn or grow within the career um, career into the field. Um, explain where you saw the job posting. Also, if you had the chance to already meet a person on the team, um, maybe at a job fair, then mention that here. Um, make sure that you, you make yourself stand out. So if you and that member at a job fair had um, you know, shared something um, personal or if you talked about something specifically or um, you can even mention the fact that like I enjoy meeting um, a member on your of your team at um, XYZ college uh, career fair um, thank you for taking the time to meet with or to speak with me and even just that is a different way of making yourself stand out um, because it's showing that not only are you interested enough to go to the career fair and are you looking for a job, um, but you also have to meet with somebody and they might recognize your name or they might remember a conversation that you had that can move you up on their list of employment or on their list of applicants they really want to meet with. So you definitely, if you have, um, you know, something that really stood out in a conversation, then mention that in here so they can put a face to um, the cover letter and resume that they're receiving. And then you, um, in your second paragraph, you want to explain your experience and how it relates to the job. So explain your work, volunteer, or school experience that um, relates to the job. This needs to be clear um, that you have the skills to perform the job requirements that are being asked. And then in paragraph three, make sure you show all the ways that you stand out um, compared to other candidates. This can include if you feel really strongly about the profession, um, express that. If you, um, you just want to make sure that it's clear why you are the best fit um, for the job. The last paragraph, you need to be wrapping it up, um, making sure you say thank you to whoever the hiring manager is for their time and express that you would appreciate the chance for an interview. Um, because just because you submit a resume and just because you um, complete a cover letter doesn't mean a guarantee for an interview. And then lastly, don't forget to sign your letter. Okay, so now looking at an example cover letter. So this is the headings that I was talking about. So when you're writing a cover letter, you wanna make sure that you have the proper headings. First off, you start with your full name your contact information and the order of address, phone, and then email. Then you include the date. Under the date, you're going to include the hiring manager's name and the company's address. After that, um, you include the proper greeting heading. Try to make this as personal as possible. If you know the exact person that the cover letter is going to, there's no need to put to whom it may concern. 
um, put the person's name if you if you know. Also, this might require some research on your part. Um, don't be lazy and opt into the who it may concern just because uh, you don't want to do the research to find out who the hiring manager is. But if you legitimately cannot find out um, who a hiring manager is or the HR person, um, then it's completely acceptable to put to whom it may concern. And again, emphasis on making sure that all of your information is correct. Um, also, emphasis on if you do know the hiring manager's name, verify that you spelled it correct. Um, nothing more awkward than you know spelling somebody else's name um, not the right way. Definitely not a good start to a cover letter. Okay, and then continuing on the example. So the body of your letter should follow the guidelines as before. In the first paragraph, the applicant expressed interest and informs um, the interviewer about where they found a job posting. The second paragraph, he clearly explains how he has experience to perform the job. Um, and then the third paragraph, is, um, he is explaining how he is different than others and by having strong commitments and being very excited about the position um, that allows the applicant to merge their interests. Um, in closing, the applicant expresses appreciation for the opportunity to interview for the position. It's important to also thank the person reading um, for their time spent on your application. Don't forget to sign the letter with a closing sincere and your name. Um, if you have the opportunity to actually sign the letter, please do so. So typically it'll be sincere. You can find your name right here or underneath your, your name. Um, so if you are doing it, if you have like Adobe, you can sign on Adobe PDF. Or if you're physically like sending out this letter, you can sign it that way as well. Just things to make you look a little bit more professional. Um, so, this um, cover letter does really well of following the steps um, that we discussed. So he letting him know that he recently graduated with Latin Arts and Latino Studies. Um, he saw the job announcement on the engineer program manager on um, for engineer program manager on the Opportunity Knox website, um, and letting him know that he is interested in uh, making this a stepping stone in his career. Um, and then later on, he expressed you know, his interest in affordable housing um, and also um, being able to merge those interests for him um, and why he is very excited for the position um, and then also expressing his appreciation for the opportunity for an interview um, and then also looking forward to follow up and thank you and thanking the person reading it for the consideration of the application. Okay. Moving forward on to interview tips. So a couple of interview tips uh, to make a job interview go smooth. Um, research as much as possible, um, and it's possibly the most important thing that you can do um, before a job interview. Um, look at companies' websites um, that you are interested in working for and take notes of things that you have questions about or things that you're interested in um, knowing more about. So especially whenever you're starting new at an organization or starting new at a company, if you express interest in um, you know, maybe programs that the organization does or you know, maybe something that the company does, um, then there's a great chance that you might be able to just shadow or you might even be able to spend some time um, within that department to be able to understand what that looks like and be able to have a good understanding of like, this is something that interests me and maybe that position isn't open now, but maybe there will be an opening later on and just having an idea that you've already had interest in that and also letting the employer know that you have interest in that. And that, um, then there's a greater chance of you actually being able to be in that field later on. So it's possibly the most important thing you can do. Um, definitely look into the company's website. Um, look at Glassdoor. You can look at what people said about um, different companies and organizations. 
Uh, make sure you write down questions that you have. It's very useful for whenever you're actually in the interview. Um, so good thing to know. Um, and you can even sometimes look up the person um, that might be interviewing you. So going a step beyond just knowing their name. Um, if you know the person that you'll be, you'll be interviewing with, you can actually look them up and maybe you'll be able to find their LinkedIn um, page and you can see you know, the experience that they had or how long they've been with the company or um, you know, maybe you can see where they went to school, see if you're an alum of the same school. So I actually did this um, for the job that I am currently uh, working at here with Equal Heart. I was able to find the exact person that was interviewing me um, for the second interview and I didn't know the person. So I uh, looked up his LinkedIn and I was able to see that he had recently moved out of the education sector and moved into um, more of the um, food deserts and just um, food acquisition sector. So we had a very good conversation in my interview um, because I was doing the same thing. I was moving out of the um, education sector and moving into the food acquisition sector. So it was very easy for us to find common ground and then just start talking about the schools that we were serving in and what districts and the challenges we faced. And it became a lot more um, real conversation than what most interviews end up turning out to be. So instead of it just being question and answer, it was actually a conversation about previous experiences. Um, and it definitely made me feel more comfortable just because I already knew um, that he would have an interest in education. So had I not looked him up, I probably wouldn't have really focused on the fact that I was um, leaving education and going, you know, changing my career past the bat. Um, but being able to find out that he had recently done the exact same thing, um, it made it common ground and it also made it something that I really wanted to emphasize on. Um, compared to me probably not spending little to no time on it um, had I not looked him up. And then um, you also want to make sure that you are um, you are practicing. So um, you definitely want to make sure that you give yourself a chance to practice. So look up common interview questions um, and answer them out loud to get comfortable speaking about your strengths. Um, know a couple of your weaknesses um, and be honest with yourself about them. Um, but also understand how you still are able to strive to overcome them. Um, so you can expect to answer questions such as, um, can you tell me about yourself? What made you leave your current or last job? Um, why do you want this job? Describe a time when you overcome a difficult work situation. Um, make sure that whenever you're answering the question, you're saying more than just one sentence. So again, this goes back to the idea that rather than it being just question and answer type of format, you really want this interview to be a conversation. You want it to be comfortable. Um, so that doesn't mean ramble on about random <laughs> things that don't pertain to the interview, but rather make it, um, make sure that you're getting all the information that is important across. So consider the fact that the employer is taking time out of their day to meet with you and um, make that meeting worthwhile. So really explain your answer in full. So a common example, um, the common questions at nonprofits is often, is often um, why are you interested in serving with the program? And the common answer is typically a one sentence long answer of because I like to give back to the community, which nothing wrong with, um, you know, liking to, enjoying giving back to the community, um, but definitely expand. Um, you want to make this as personable as possible. So you want to explain why, why do you like giving back to the community? Always give the why. So it could, it would be stronger um, if you say, 
As an aware citizen, I see the need for food assistance programs such as XYZ. I want to actively make a difference in my community by providing food to families in need. I will, um, I will be committed to the program by my love to give back to my local community. So this is obviously showing that the reason why you like giving back to the community is one, because you're an aware citizen and you understand the need of the program. Two, because you're interested in making a difference in the community and providing food. And three, you are very committed to it because you have a love of doing that. It's a huge difference compared to saying, I like giving back or I like making a difference. Um, give exact reasons why you like doing that. You know, if you, know, if you, um, if you grew up in you had a hard time finding, or your parents had a hard time, you know, serving meals on the table every single time. Mention that if you're comfortable with it. If you, um, for whatever reason, you know, have a love for community service and it's something you've always had a love for and you've been volunteering since you're young, mention that. Mention that, you know, you're committing your life to public service. That's, that's something very honorable that you can mention um, that goes far beyond just saying that you're interested in giving back to the community. So next tip is to come prepared. So have three to five questions, um, if not more, but definitely don't have 20 to 30 questions. You definitely wanna be uh, respectful of their time. Um, to ask the person that's interviewing you. So easy questions, if you don't think of any by yourself, um, can easily be, what is the daily dress code? Um, what is the typical day like? What are some of the main challenges of this role? Um, what is the organization's uh, management style? Where is the organization's big goals for the next five to 10 years? Um, what do you enjoy about working here? So remember that you are interviewing the business or the core organization as much as what they are interviewing you. You want to make sure that this is the right fit, not only for them, but also for you. So um, you want to make sure you're happy with your job um, as they are with you being there. So you also want to be prepared um, on what you're going to be wearing. So make sure that you are dressed for the job, um, meaning that if, it is, if the business is a little bit more casual, um, then you'll be fine dress, dressing a little bit more business casual. Um, if the position is more of a professional job, then dress business professional. Common tips are avoid wearing white socks, avoid open toe shoes, leave hats and headphones at home, um, choose a belt that matches your shoes. And if you are tucking in your shirt, make sure that you are wearing a belt. Avoid wearing shorts, and if you decide to wear a dress or skirt, Make sure it is an appropriate length. Um, a good way to find out if something is an appropriate length or not um, is if you have access to a full body mirror um, and a movable chair, then move the chair in front of the mirror uh, or vice versa, whatever works for you, and sit down in that outfit and see if there's any um, gapping that's like showing anything that you don't want to show. Um, Definitely want to make sure that you are um, properly dressed, not only when you're standing up, but also when you're sitting down. Um, so just consider that if you're wearing a dress or skirt, if you don't want to mess around with that, just wear pants. <laughs> uh, easiest solution. Um, and then also depending on how professional you're trying to look, um, definitely recommend tights or pantyhose. Um, and of course, you don't want to wear um, you know, shoes are maybe uncomfortable to walk in or um, shoes that you can't necessarily walk in that would be too high. You definitely want to keep it professional. Um, so along with that, um, I would recommend that if it is questionable, um, don't wear it. If you're not sure if it is too much, um, don't wear it. I would recommend just um, choosing something else. So you would also want to minimize the amount of perfume, um, the amount of jewelry and makeup that you wear. Um, so you're not going to the club. 
Um, you are going into a job interview. You don't want to invade the person's face with all your smells. Um, so definitely don't wear anything overbearing. Um, but also you're there to look professional. Um, so definitely, you know, maybe maybe leave your really bright makeup at home. Um, definitely some more neutrals than anything else. So along with being prepared is knowing what you're taking with you. So please refrain from bringing a backpack or oversized purse. Um, I would recommend bringing your resume, cover letter, references, maybe a professional notebook um, to jot down um, some notes on, um, a pen, and then your list of questions. So a big thing that I left out there is your phone. So um, Whenever you're going into a job interview, you want to make sure that you're giving your 100% attention to the person that is interviewing you. And the worst thing that can happen is that you receive a phone call in the middle of your interview. It's very awkward. Um, and you might be given the option to go ahead and take the phone call. Um, but no matter what, it's just not respectful of the person's time that is um, taking the time to be there and uh, interview you. So out of respect, I strongly recommend leaving your phone in your car or making sure that it's completely turned off. Um, or even if you have the option for do not disturb, um, place them do not disturb for that time being. Um, just I strongly, strongly recommend that. Now, if you want to take your phone because you have your references on there or because um, that's where you have majority of your information, I completely understand. Um, but after you receive that information off your phone, put it away. Um, that is including the time that you are waiting for your interview. Um, take that time to make small talk. Um, you know, take that time to really get an understanding of what the organization is about. Um, if there is somebody sitting there, then you can also take the opportunity to talk to them, get to know them. Um, you never know, that could be your next coworker. So when walking and you want to make sure that you're carrying um, the items that you have with you in your left hand, so you're ready for a firm handshake. Um, so focusing on the next tip of staying calm, one thing that helps me is making sure that I arrive early and have some time to like calm myself down in the car before I go into an interview. Um, so I would strongly, strongly recommend um, maybe arrive, like arriving no more than 15 minutes early. Um, you definitely don't want to just be sitting around um, for so long. So I, would, I wouldn't I would recommend showing up any earlier than 15 minutes, honestly. Um, so be, be respectful of that. But at the same time, um, get there early enough to where you're not rushing through traffic, you're not worrying about trying to find somewhere to park real quick. Um, if it's your first time ever going to that location, I would recommend either one, going there before your interview, if you have the chance, or two, making sure you're leaving yourself enough time if, one, there's a parking garage and the garage is full, or if um, it's a really big building and you're not sure exactly what floor or where to find a room, get there early so you have enough time to get lost and uh, find the right direction. Um, so definitely take account all of those things and also make sure that before you leave um, for the interview, you know a point of contact with somebody that you can get in, in touch with if all else turns out bad and you are running late. Um, at least you can let that person know um, rather than already being on the highway and having to send a very last minute email. Um, it's much better to give them a phone call letting them know that you know, X, Y, and Z happened, I am on my way, if it is possible um, to still have the interview, that looks much more professional um, than a an email sent out or maybe even no communication letting them know you're running late. So very important and an easy way to stay calm is just getting there early and planning with enough time. Um, stay positive and visualize the outcome that you want. Um, so just being able to stay positive and say that, you know, whatever happens is going to be for the best. And, you know, maybe this isn't 
if I don't get it, maybe this isn't the job for me. And also being positive enough to um, take whatever happens and if it's light. So the next tip is to be professional. Um, so this means that everybody that you encounter, treat them with respect. Um, make sure that you give everybody a, a firm handshake that you are meeting. Um, be mindful of your language um, that's coming out of your mouth, but also of your body language. Refrain from being emotional in your interview. Um, this doesn't mean like show no excitement or not laugh or anything like that. Um, rather, if there's something um, really touching about your story, your personal story um, that you want to share, just make sure it isn't too emotional. Um, because if it is too emotional, it might be best not to share it. Uh, there's nothing more awkward for an employer to have a first sense of adjustment um, start crying in their office. Um, so I would strongly recommend that if it is too personal for you, hold off on it. You know, maybe later on in a couple years or even in a couple months, um, maybe you'll be able to have time to process it a little bit more. And maybe then um, you'll you'll be more in control of being able to share that experience without getting, getting overly emotional. Um, so I definitely recommend holding off on it then. The last thing, um, whenever you're giving the person interviewing uh, you all your attention, like how I was said before, make sure that your phone is on silent. Um, all other technology, including your, if you have a smartwatch, if you have, um, you know, anything, any other type of technology is turned off. Um, whenever you're speaking, make sure that you're looking the interviewer in the eyes as well as whenever they're speaking to you. Um, refrain from moving around too much or talking with your hands too often. And lastly, our last tip is to follow up with a thank you letter or email, um, thanking the interviewer for their time and reminding them that you enjoyed the interview and look forward to hearing back from them. This can be um, our handwritten thank you letter, which will probably be much appreciated in the world of technology, or it can be a um, email just letting us like, Thank you. I look forward to hearing back from you. This can be um, acceptable anywhere from about 24 to 48 hours after your interview. If it's been two months and um, you haven't heard back from them, there's no need to make a follow-up. Um, most likely, they won't be moving forward. Um, or they're really busy and you know might not even correlate who that thank you notice from. Okay. All right, now that we are at the end of the webinar, um, I would like to say a big thank you for being here. And then um, I would like to open up the um, chat room now to questions. So if you have any questions about resumes, cover letters, interviewing, um, finding the right career for you, anything like that, definitely type them into the chat box now um, and I'll be addressing those questions. Okay, so the first question I received is who prepares the recommendation letter? So um, today we talked about two different ways um, that you can prepare your recommendation letter. So I strongly recommend talking to your site manager or whoever you are requesting um, the recommendation letter from. So if you're, if you're asking your site manager and they tell you like, yeah, I can write you a recommendation letter, then they will be writing it for you. So they'll be preparing it. Um, but if your site manager has 30 people to write recommendation letters for, you have a chance of getting a very generic re or cover, or, sorry, recommendation letter. So I would recommend giving the option. And again, this is going with talking to your site supervisor, giving the option of you writing it for them to review. So in that case, you would be preparing the recommendation letter for yourself. I know that's a little confusing, um, but in this way you are able to critique yourself and be honest. Um, and then the supervisor gets to review it and sign off on it. And then there's also kind of like a, an in-between of both people creating one 
and then it being merged. Um, again, that's what one of my high school teachers used to do. So he would have us write a um, recommendation letter for ourselves, and then we he would also write one, and we would talk about it together, and actually merge the two, and then that's the one he would actually sign off on. So it really depends on, I guess it depends on a couple things. One, the amount of time that your manager has, and then also if your manager makes it a little too vague and maybe you want to be a little more specific, then communicate that to your manager. Um, but I would strongly recommend just communicating with your site manager and figuring out what would work best. Um, but if they're really, if you know that they really um, have a tight schedule or something like that, then maybe recommending that you can write one for them to approve would be a better way to go about it. Okay. The next question I received is if I, I am moving after the summer, what do I put for my address? Um, so for your cover letter and for your resume, you want to make sure that your information is up to date. If you are moving to a new location um, after the summer or after, you know, whenever you're sending this information or creating it, then you can put that you are anticipated to move and either the month or the year that you're anticipated to move then. So this means that um, it, let's say you're moving to Colorado in, um, in September. So at the top of your resume where you would normally put your address, you can put um, anticipated moving to Colorado in September of 2020 or September of 2019. So they have an understanding that, although right now this, you know, your current address is Texas, uh, you are moving to Colorado and that's already anticipated for a set time. That goes as far as any other um, documents as well. Okay, I'll give you a couple more minutes for any other questions. Okay. If there are no more questions, um, then on the screen now is my contact information. If you have any other questions or if you'd like to schedule um, time to meet with me um, and we can review your cover letter, we can go over writing a recommendation letter and or um, preparing for an interview or creating a resume. Um, I offer all those services through Equal Heart. So whenever you're ready to take the next step, you can definitely get in contact with me and we could Skype, you can come in person to my office, or um, we could do it over the phone um, and really sit down and you know figure out what's your next step and ways to really improve um, you know, these very important pieces of uh, paper that are could um, change the way that you go in your career. Um, along with that, um, you know, if you ever need resume help, cover letter, mock interviews, um, internship or job help. I also do that as well, as well as um, college help if you're not sure what college to go to or if you're interested in maybe changing your major, I can also help with that. Um, so just feel free to reach out. Um, I hope that this was a useful webinar. Um, and I look forward to assisting you all in the future. Um, so that is the end of our second webinar um, but I will be staying on for our third webinar which is going to start here in just a few minutes uh, about how to resolve conflict. So thank you everybody and I hope you stay on for the next one.